In the fourth century, Constantine became a Christian. He then said, well, I'm not going to keep the Jewish Sabbath, the seventh day. We're in Rome. We're going to keep the sun god day. So that came to the church. And then they were worshiping idols. The Romans loved idols. And they brought them into the church and began to tell people to prostrate themselves to those things. Another big cultural shift that came in the church was through Roman thought. Romans loved philosophy. And one of their favorite philosophers was Plato. Now, Plato was a funny guy. I'm going to walk over here and ask you something. What is this? Piano. piano. How many say it's a piano? Plato would disagree with you. He would say, that's not a piano. That's not a chair. See, Plato had the idea that the, the a real thing, the real piano, has a certain number of we call atoms. Not one more, not one less. And that is the real essence of the piano, the real thing. And that's so perfect, it's invisible. This is just a copy of the piano. This is not a chair. This is just a copy of the chair. The real chair is invisible. Yeah, he's like, woo, 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 okay? You think Plato was crazy? No, he actually was well loved by a lot of people, still read today his books. But he also had that with humans, where he said that the human has, as the chair has the essence, the invisible, and this is the copy. So this is just a copy of Ryan Council. The real Ryan Council is invisible. It's this immortal soul. You see, the Romans believed in transmigration of the soul. They believed that the soul was the real Ryan Council. And that this was just a shell that we're in. But when you died, the soul would leave, maybe haunt a house, live in a castle, go to heaven, hell, purgatory, wherever. But that the real Ryan Council didn't die. That was the that was the, the soul that transmigrated. And this thought came in the church. The Romans love philosophy. Remember how they used, used to philosophize with Paul? <laughs> and they would they loved their idols. And so by the 4th century, this philosophy came into the Christian church of this immortal soul. Now, when we die, the Bible's clear that we sleep until the resurrection. Lazarus died. He slept four days. And what did Jesus do? He was awakened, right? Had Lazarus been in heaven or hell? No, he was asleep. But this idea came into the church from Roman thought. Actually, where did the first idea come from? The dead are not dead. It came from uh, Genesis chapter 3. It's actually the, record, the first recorded lie in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Genesis 3, 3 and 4. And the devil there, through the snake, is talking. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, was that a, a lie? It was. Yeah, the devil's big lie is that we will not really die. In fact, that's what all religions have in common, whether it's Confucianism or Taoism or Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever other ism, the idea that <clears throat> you don't really die. When the body dies, the, the, the real you, the essence, the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, continues to live on. And yet, the wages of sin is death. And when we die, we are really dead, is what the Bible says. This is a controversial view, I understand. People still claim that man has an immortal soul that never dies. And they often quote this verse to prove it. When I was a, a Baptist, I remember going to Baptist funerals. I'd always hear the preacher quote, Again, again, the Bible says, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he would always put him in heaven. I don't know whether that increased his offerings or what. He never put anybody in hell. <laughs> he, he put them all in heaven. And he insisted that they were watching the funeral. Well, in order to, present, to properly understand this uh, verse of absence of the body principle, we need to look at the context of the chapter of that. And today and next week, we'll be looking at that two parts 
of that study. So let's get into it. Paul makes uh, many points in this chapter. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, and I have the New King James. Uh, there's lots of other translations out there that uh, are good, uh, but we'll make uh, the points out of this translation today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. My wife has been uh, always asking about this verse, so I thought I would parse it and do it for her because she, in her line of work, meets all kinds of people, and they always find out that she's their pastor's wife, and they ask her about the state of the dead, and she testifies, and they always bring up these verses to her, and so she's wondering, well, what, is, what does the Bible say about the dead? Well, what does the Bible say about absent from the body? Well, how do you understand what a soul is or a spirit is? Where do these ideas come from? So I'm trying to make some sense of that to help her and maybe other ones as well. That's a good review. Chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible compares our flesh body to being a tent. What is it compared to? A tent. Okay, and our eternal heavenly body is being our eternal house. Okay, so he uses an allegory here. Chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, the King James there has tabernacle, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, he is not talking here about the home in glory land that Jesus went to make. John 14 says, I go to bear a pair of place for you in my father's house of many mansions. That's a home that we're going to actually live in. That's not what Paul is talking about here. Here he's comparing the eternal body in heaven, which has the robe of righteousness, which will live forever, versus the body on earth, which is more called the tent. He says that we have two. We have the, the body on earth that we live in, but we also will have someday the heavenly body. The question is, when do we inherit those heavenly bodies? Some would argue that we get the heavenly bodies the moment we die. Others would say, well, what does the Bible actually say upon that? So today, I want to do a study on this. Not what I say or the Pope says or anybody else says, but what the Bible says. So we can get from Scripture the correct understanding of what it is Paul was talking about. Now, it's natural that Paul was a tent maker, that he was using a term that would uh, be in comparison to his job. He's calling our bodies here as tents or tabernacles. Why? Well, <clears throat> comes comparisons. Both the body and the tent are made out of earth elements, right? Everything in this body is found in the earth. They're temporal in nature. And both the body and the tent are easily destroyed. So he calls us in the tent when we're in our bodies. This is uh, not uncommon in the early Christian church to refer to this. Peter also refers to people as being in tents. Now, uh, Peter uh, wrote about Paul's writings as some hard to understand. They can be hard to understand. Also, Paul wrote in ecclesiastical Greek. He wrote in the, the high narratives. He wrote with a, um, a Pharisee. He used rabbinical reasoning or rabbinical thought. Many times he would be here and then he'd say, okay, and then he'd be over here and say, why aren't you over here? Okay, over here. Then he'd jump back. Hey, I'm not there anymore. Back over here. <laughs> He's trying to read it. It's hard. In fact, Peter says about Paul's writings that they are, how does Peter say about them? Hard to understand. Yeah, hard to understand, but some rest with, with their own destruction. But Paul uh, wrote beautiful. He wrote poetically. He wrote in allegorical language, rabbinical thought, ecclesiastical Greek. Sometimes hard to follow. Now, his tent illustration was also common to Peter. Keep your finger there, 2 Corinthians, and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 2 Peter 1, verse 13. And the New King James I'm reading here says, 
Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent or tabernacle. What was he talking about? This body, right? This earthly, fleshly body. Okay? To stir you up by reminding you, knowing that surely I must put off my tent, this the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. What does it mean, put off his tent? He's referring here to his crucifixion. The Lord told him that he would be crucified. Remember, Jesus was crucified uh, feet down, and Peter, not wanting to be crucified like his Lord, was crucified head down. The tabernacle, or tent, is this body. It's earthly, it's fleshly, it's temporal, it's easily destroyed, it has a short lifespan, and so it's a fitting to call it a tent. Both Peter and the Apostle Paul refer to this as a tent. As Christians, we long to one day be out of our tents and into our new heavenly bodies. Don't we? Don't we all sing about it, right? Glory land, we'll have those bodies and we'll be able to eat the tree of life. Yeah, we sing about it, it's been a joy. Chapter 5, verse 2 of 2 Corinthians. We'll back to that verse then again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. Reading on, it says there, for in this, what is the this? This is a demonstrative pronoun, right? You have this and that, you get the point. So where would this be? This, your body, pointing to this. In this, for in this, we groan. Okay, we groan. <laughs> Earnestly desiring to be clothed. All right, there's a new word. Clothed. What's it talking about? What has Jesus promised to give us in our new Heavenly home. A robe of what? Righteousness. So we're going to be clothed in robes of righteousness. We're going to be in our beautiful bodies in heaven. Not our natural body, but our spiritual body. that will be coming up when Jesus makes us anew. So he's talking here about uh, this. So we groan earnestly desire to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Now keep in mind that word clothed, that refers to where? What happens in heaven with our new bodies? Not, not on the tent. In the tent, we're not clothed. Okay? And so to be clothed means to be out of our mortal body, which is called a tent, and to instead be clothed or living in our eternal heavenly body called the house. Now everyone desires to be right now in heaven if possible. We all groan in this body. As it gets older, we groan a lot more, don't we? <laughs> it's older, we groan more. Yet we know we have to wait until the change happens. Jesus promises that. And sometimes we die. I think of two good pastors of Michigan Conference that both Pastor and I uh, were worked with and loved dearly, Dan Collins and Laura Nelson. Who are men who were priests in my pulpit who taught me how to be a pastor, went out with me when I was a young intern, taught me how to visit people, how to preach, how to give altar calls, spent so much time with me, and, and you as well, when you worked with these two, these two wonderful men of God. And now they sleep till the resurrection morning. So we, we all long to be in the heavenly body, but many of us won't make it and haven't made it. Paul actually desires, if possible, to avoid death altogether and to instead be translated alive. Paul wrote in faith, 1 Thessalonians 4, he says there, For the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain. Who's the we? Himself. He hoped that he would be translated alive. He didn't want to die. But we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air, right? That was his hope. But we know that towards the end of his life, he realized that he would die. He would be in that sleep mode of death. So he's writing here of his desire to avoid death altogether and to be translated alive. So we have the, the old body, the tent. We have the heavenly body in heaven. The step in between is death, except for those 
144,000 who will be translated alive. And they will go from what? Old tent to new body in a twinkling of an eye. But that's a rare few, 144,000, that will be part of that event. The rest of us, the Bible says, are going to face death. Chapter 2, verse 5, uh, five uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2 and 3. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 3. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed in our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Being found naked means that we are dead. But the Bible makes clear that not all will die. Many Christians will become clothed in their heavenly bodies without ever being naked. This will occur at the second coming when the living are translated. In other words, Paul is saying, if while still alive, he can clothe us in our heavenly body, then we will never be found naked. This is what's his hope. And he's talking about that group of people there. So keep in mind, to be clothed means to have the, the heavenly body versus the tent body. Be unclothed or naked means to be dead. That stage in between. Then Paul makes clear that we groan in this body. However, that does not mean that we long for death. Instead, we long for our heavenly bodies. Continue reading now in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, what is unclothed? Dead. Okay. He says, we don't groan because we want to be dead. <laughs> Why do we groan? But further clothed. What does that mean? To have the heavenly body, right? That mortality may be swallowed up by life. So we are tabernacles or tents and we groan. We don't groan to be unclothed and naked, which means death. But instead, we groan to be clothed with life and immortality. So that is what he tells us there. It's plain from this verse that our mortality is not exchanged for immortality until we are clothed with our house from heaven. We see then that we don't have an immortal soul living in us that goes to heaven without us. Paul here gives no support for the idea that at death, when a person is unclothed or naked, that he enters upon an immortal state of existence. He does it all. Now, to get a deeper understanding of Paul, we're going to read his writings in different books on the same topic. so We can garner a deeper understanding. This is a challenging passage, but one I know that is important to understand. What did the Apostle Paul say? I will not have thee to be ignorant, but brethren, concerning those which have what? Died. He says in 2 Thessalonians. So he does not, or does not want us to be ignorant on this day of the dead. Least of all, would Paul want us to misunderstand what he wrote about this day of the dead. So we're going to be clear on that. Let's turn to 2 Timothy now, chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. And looking at this verse... Now, in a different book, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 or 8. Notice what he says. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering at the time of my departure is at hand. For I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So, the crown of righteousness is what we have when we're saved. When do we get the crown of righteousness? Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. What day is he talking about? The day of his death or the day of his appearing? He tells us, and not only to me, but also we have loved his appearing. So the appearing of Jesus, we get our crown, amen? The appearing of Jesus, we get our robe of righteousness. The appearing of Jesus, we trade those tents in on a new model, right? <laughs> The, the, the spiritual uh, Ryan Council, okay? the spiritual Pastor Bob Stewart, 
not this earthly tent that is that is temporal. But he's clear when we get that, we'll be at his coming, not at death. Paul and everyone will get their crown at the resurrection, not at death. So back to uh, now 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes a lot about the state of the dead here. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. Start reading there. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a what? Spiritual body. The body we live in here is the physical body. Natural. Made of earthly substance. The Bible says that God gathered the dust of the ground. He made a corpse. He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Genesis 2 verse 7. Notice he doesn't take a ghost to put it in Adam. We are souls. We don't have souls. This is where the misunderstanding. Some will ask my wife, "Well, where does the soul go when you die?" It's kind of like a, like a, like an old box, a couple boards and some small tack nails, and you have a little box. If you take the tack nails out and the wood apart, you stack the wood here and you put the tacks here. Where did the box go? It ceased to exist. It didn't go anywhere. It just ceased to exist. When we die. Our soul ceases to exist because what happens? The breath of life that God lends us goes back to God and the body is goes to the ground and we cease to exist until the resurrection morning. So we uh, notice that we have that natural body and a spiritual body. Let's continue reading on now verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. That's a key word there, change. When is the change going to happen? Does change happen when we die? I remember as a Baptist, the, the Baptist preacher used to say, heaven's a wonderful place. People are just dying to get in. The idea was that the way to release yourself from this miserable world is just die and you get to go to heaven because they would, they would quote and say, after the body is present with the Lord. So if you don't like this, this planet, this world, just quickly die, then you get to go to heaven. But is that supported by the scriptures? No, it's not. Because the Bible says that after our tent dies, what happens? We're buried and we sleep. Until when? Until that day when we're raised from the dead. And when will that day be? The last day of earth's history, right? When Jesus returns from the cause of glory and raises the dead. Until then we sleep and await the resurrection. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So then, this corruption has put in corruption, this moral has put in immortality, then shall be brought past the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? So, we do not possess in our immortal bodies a soul. The wages of sin is death. People are not immortal. They really die. That's a terrible thought, but it's just the wages of sin. We don't get immortality until Jesus comes at the resurrection. The Bible says that we get our spiritual body at the last trump. When is the last trump going to be? When Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, east the sky. Sure. Both the dead and the living receive immortality and are clothed in new bodies at the second coming. I've been to lots of funerals. I've heard the preachers say the funerals. Uncle Ralph is in heaven and he's drinking that living water. And I wonder, I 
How is Uncle Ralph drinking living water when he doesn't have a stomach? He's just a spirit. <laughs> Uncle Ralph is in heaven. He's dancing on the streets of gold. Wait a minute. I didn't know that spirits had any feet. <laughs> Dance. Brothers, Granny is in heaven and he's eating the tree of life. He doesn't have any teeth. Remember when Jesus had died and had risen again, they saw him and thought he was a ghost? What did Jesus say? You have some fish? Like eat it? Can spirits eat? No. So he ate the fish, proving that he wasn't a spirit, right? He was a, a real, real being. And yet, if the dead are in heaven already, and they have teeth and stomach and feet, then why do they need another body again at the second coming? Furthermore, if the dead are already in heaven, then why does he even need to come back to earth? They're already in heaven. The whole point of Paul's gospel, the blessed hope, is that Jesus will come back to raise the dead. The dead of the tent that are buried and that now are found naked, unclothed in that death state, are sleeping, awaiting the resurrection when Jesus will come again in the eastern sky and raise the dead, blow the trumpet. Let's now look at that questionable text about being absent of the body. Remember, Paul groans in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Remember, as we turn there, Paul groans to be out of this body and into the heavenly body. He, and this doesn't happen until the second coming. Therefore, Paul is not groaning to be dead and become a spirit without a body. He's longing to be out of this mortal body and to be present with God in his new body. Notice chapter 5, verse uh, 6 through 8. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. What's he talking about? As long as we are in this tent, are we in heaven? No, no we're not. Okay. Where would you rather be if you had a choice? In your heavenly body or your tent earthly body? You'd rather be in the heavenly body. And so would Paul. That's exactly what he says. The next verse. Verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8. We are confident, yes. Well pleased, rather to be, what? Absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So he's simply saying that he would rather be. The word, therefore, uh, rather be, or willing, is the same word that God the Father used for Jesus on pleased. What did he say when Jesus was baptized? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Paul is saying here, I would be, I would be pleased, rather, to be absent from this tent and up in heaven. But he knows that that will not happen until when? To the coming of Jesus. This is where people get it wrong. They mistakenly take that view that Plato taught, this immortal soul. The idea that once you die, your soul then is transmigrated and instantly you receive your heavenly reward of the spiritual body of heaven. But we don't get that until Jesus Christ comes again and gives us the eternal body in the second coming. So Paul longs to be out of his body and his body in heaven. But we walk by faith and it hasn't happened yet. I love this time of year when the butterflies start coming back. I haven't seen one yet. The monarchs are one of my favorites. And the butterfly has something in common with, with us Christians. In our tent, we're not, we're not very glorious. We're kind of like the monarch caterpillar. You know, the caterpillar is kind of ugly, it's, it's a worm, it's very gushy. Can you imagine one climbing on your nose? Ugh, you know, it's just like, yeah, he's the heebie jeebie. You know, he's a bug, it's got the claw, it, it eats, it spits, it's like, ah, you're nothing, you're just a bug. <laughs> then the caterpillar has to go to sleep for a while. And then it comes out, a beautiful winged creature. And if it lands on your head, you feel, ah, he's so beautiful. I'm the same creature? No, you're not. Before you were just a bug. Now you're a butterfly. Okay. 
And so we, we are intent. We're, we're dark, we're sinful, right? But when we sleep, we'll come out of the grave, how? In a heavenly body, maybe with wings, glorious. Or we'll be able to be with God Almighty, amen? And it'll be a glory time. So we have that metamorphosis time. And Paul is here contrasting the, the two states between uh, being on the tent and being there. And he said, we would please be in rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Nevertheless, we are absent from the Lord now and where? Present with the body, but are, we'd be pleased to be present with God. Then Paul makes some clear points about salvation. And salvation is intended for all who accept it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15. It says there, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. This is called the substitute atonement, where Jesus Christ dies as a substitute for us. As Adam sinned, we all sinned through Adam. As Jesus was the second Adam, we all are born again through Jesus Christ. You don't know why. He is watching. <laughs> he has the old nature. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. We'll forgive him. I'm forgetting now. And so the uh, the uh, where do we go? Okay, he's not gonna see me on this. Oh, he's back there. All right. We see then that Paul says that we will then be righteous by grace through faith through Jesus Christ, at least until the judgment. Notice this point in verse 10, our last verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in the body according to that which has done, whether good or bad. So we are... Saved by grace through faith, but do we still have to go through the judgment? We do. We don't need to fear the judgment. Jesus Christ is our righteous advocate, amen? amen? As long as we are his bride, he gets us through the judgment. He declares us righteous by grace through faith. The problem is what happens when people want to follow Jesus, but then they don't want to have him as their husband anymore, and they want to have the other world. It kind of reminds me of the parable of... Uh, Jezebel McGillicuddy. There's a parable, you know. Jezebel McGillicuddy, she doesn't like her last name, McGillicuddy. She wants a name like Smith. So she goes to the bar, she finds a guy named Smith, she marries him. Now she says, I just got that old bad name, now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Smith. He says, you want to come home and live with me? She says, no, I have my own place, thank you very much. But you married me, it doesn't matter. Are we going to share bank accounts together? No, no, I have all my own money, no, my own place. And I'm going to still date all the old boyfriends you used to have. But you're married to me. I just wanted your name. Sometimes Christians say, oh, I want to be a Christian, so I have the name Christian. So now you're a Christian, you're baptized, you're a, body, you're a member of the body, and who is the church? His bride, right? You want to come to my house with me? No, of course not. That's my own place. Do you want to share your money with me? No, it's all my money. No, no. No, you want to come and worship me? No, I have other people I like to be with instead. Then why did you marry me? Just your name. I like the name to be called a Christian. And these kind will not make it to the judgment, will they? Because they're not truly following Jesus. So we're righteous by grace through faith. He forgives us of our sins. He declares us his bride. Then he asks us to be faithful. What does he say in John 14, 15? If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. We don't keep the commandments to be saved. We keep the commandments because we love Jesus. Because we love Jesus, he then saves his bride. Amen? Through the cross of Calvary. Don't be mistaken. We don't work for our salvation. No, no. We do good works because we love our, what? Savior, Jesus Christ. In turn, he washes his bride, redeems her, and treats her affectionately, and then saves her upon the cross through his shedding. That's the beautiful story about redemption. So as we're faithful, let's remember that Jesus is coming soon. It's my hope as Christians that we will live and believe in truth. 
We should not honor though ourselves through pagan philosophy. It's important that we take our points from the Word of God. Amen? It's all the Scripture. Next week we'll look at part two of this beautiful passage of Scripture. Jesus is coming soon. But at that time, will we be ready for his soon appearing? I want to be ready. Amen? God bless you this Sabbath day.